Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning again. Uh, so today I'll be talking about incremental program obfuscation, and this is uh, joint work with, with Om Kanpani. Okay. So since this is the first talk in the obfuscation session, maybe I'll start by recalling a little bit about the notion and the definitions. So the, the goal of software obfuscation is to make computer programs unintelligible, but without affecting their functionality. Okay? So let's say you have a program P, uh, written in your favorite programming language. You would like to obfuscate the program so that this obfuscated version works just like the original one. So you could execute on this obfuscated version on your computer just as you could have executed the original program P. But I want this obfuscated version to hide the secrets that were embedded inside the original program P. So defining what, uh, this, uh, defining what it means to hide the secrets turns out to be rather tricky. And sort of the f one of the first uh, efforts to define this formally was done by Barack et al who define this very natural notion of obfuscation, which they call virtual black box obfuscation. Okay? So this, off, this notion roughly says that an obfuscated uh, version of the program uh, uh, leaks only whatever could be learned from uh, the input-output behavior of the program P. In particular, if I give the obfuscated program to, a, to an adversary, then whatever he could learn from this obfuscated version, he could learn the same things from an oracle that implements the same uh, functionality. Okay? So this is a very natural notion that Barak et al. defined, but unfortunately this turns out to be uh, a bit too strong, and there are uh, impossibility results showing that this notion, this sort of strong notion, cannot be realized in general. So you cannot arbi obfuscate arbitrary uh, uh, programs satisfying the security notion. There are positive results. Um, to, in the case of uh, restricted, restricted programs or functionality, specifically that we know how to obfuscate uh, point functions with VBB security. There are some recent results which achieve uh, such strong security properties as well. Um, one point I want to mention is that, the, a, uh, uh, that, that if you were to restrict to certain idealized models, in particular where uh, such as the, uh, the generic multilinear map model, then we can indeed realize VBB security for, for all circuits. Okay. Um, an alternative weaker notion of security, which is, uh, which, is, which is very commonly used, is the indistinguishability obfuscation notion. What this notion says is that if you have two programs, P0 and P1, which are functionally equivalent, by which I mean that on every input, the, the two programs output the same exact output, then if I was to obfuscate one of the two programs, the distributions of the obfuscations are computationally indistinguishable. Okay? Um, this notion has, has, has recently gained a lot of uh, uh, popularity, and we have constructions, general purpose construction of obfuscation satisfying the security notion, at least uh, plausible candidates. Um, it might seem like, you know, if I'm trying to obfuscate two uh, circuits that already implement the same functionality, what am I really trying to hide? It might seem like a weak notion. But there's been a long line of work that sort of suggests that um, this notion is indeed very, uh, is, is, is indeed very powerful and can hide uh, cryptographic secrets inside programs. And a number of applications have, have been demonstrated. The strongest uh, 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 formal justification uh, comes from uh, this work of uh, Goldwasser and Rotblum, which says that this notion of indistinguishability obfuscation is in fact the best possible obfuscation. In other words, whatever this notion it, it hides about the program is the best that you could hope to hide. Okay, okay so with this background, uh, let me move on to the motivation of our work, which is in the case of software updates. Uh, so you know, if you have ever used a computer, which, uh, which I assume all of you have, then uh, uh, you know, you, you've all used software which, which got updated. And um, you know, these updates are released for many reasons. So for example, there might be a bug in uh, your software that's, that's, that, that's fixed, or it could be a security vulnerability that exists and needs to be patched. Or you might have bought a software which comes with these locked features, um, and, and you're trying to, uh, you paid the, to, the service, to some service provider to, uh, to unlock that feature, or, or you got the key from, from your friend, uh, to unlock that feature, and you're trying to use that feature, and that now needs to be unlocked. So to, to, for each or any of these features to work, uh, there, there would need to be a patch or an update that will need to be applied to the software that you have. Um, 
and, and, and so uh, if we were doing the same thing in the obfuscated setting, so let's say you had the program that was obfuscated, and I, was, I wanted to apply an update, what it would translate into, to, to apply any update, the, the person who gave you the software will actually, if you used known techniques, you will have to, will have to generate a fresh copy of the updated program and give it to you, okay? So typically on your computer, you would update, when you apply the update, it's applied locally, but if you were to use this in the case of obfuscated software, you would have, the, 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 the person who provided you with the software would have to re-obfuscate the fresh copy and give it to you. And this is a problem, and this is what we want to sort of change in, in this work, okay? Um, in particular, as I said, the updates are typically small, much smaller than the size of the, uh, the, 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 the program that you're trying to update. And we want the update time to be proportional to the uh, time it takes to uh, update the unobfuscated program in, in both the communication and the computational call. The guy who's updating, his work should be less. The communication that happens should be small, and the amount of time you spend updating software at your local end should be small, the obfuscated software at your end, okay? Especially, uh, we want this to be independent of the program size, okay? Uh, model low polylog factors. Um, this is something, this is not completely new, this notion of incremental cryptography is, has been well studied. There's a lot of work uh, on the topic. Um, for example, in the setting of, of hashing, digital signatures, or deterministic encryption. And, and this is sort of inspired by this, this line of work, okay? So the key point I want to drive across in this talk is the definitions that we've provided. I'll talk uh, about the, the, some of the constructions that we have towards the end, but sort of I really want to drive across the, the, the definitions that we have, so I'll sort of go over them uh, first. Okay. So before I can tell you the definitions, I need to sort of have some modeling of how we define an update. We define an update, you know, think of any program, it can be thought of as a string. I'm going to define an update by a set S, or, or which is a subset of the, the bit locations. Uh, if the program is of size N, it's a subset of one to N, okay? And for each uh, bit location in this set S, say I, I'm gonna associate it with the function Fi, where the function fi could be the flip function, where you, know, you reverse the bit, it's a set function, could set it to one, reset, set it to zero, or do nothing. Okay? In this case, you might not have included it, but we, uh, you can include it there as well. Okay, so this is how I'm gonna model an update. And note that this way of modeling an update makes sense for the uh, unobfuscated program as well as the obfuscated version, right? These are the bit locations I wanna change, and this is how I wanna change. That, that's all this uh, modeling is specifying. Now, let's say I, uh, as, a, as a server, have a program P, and I want to give you an obfuscated version of this program, O of P, which I denote by P prime. When I provide you this obfuscated version, I'm gonna keep an update key locally at my end. We'll require this update key small, I just wanna keep it with me. Whenever I want to later update this obfuscated program that you have, uh, I'll get as an in input a set S, which describes the, up, uh, the, the, the increment that's being done on the unobfuscated program P. And I will use an oracle access to the obfuscation of P prime. I, didn't, I, I say that it's an oracle access because I don't want to touch every single bit of this pro uh, obfuscated program P prime. I'll use the update key and output a subset S prime of the locations of P prime. Okay, along with the associated functions, I'm not going to write the functions every single time. Just every time I just say an update set S, it implicitly also means there are associated functions. Okay, so I will generate the set, uh, subset S prime locally and I set you the, send you the set S prime. And now you can, on your end, update the obfuscated program, right? Okay. So this is how uh, we're gonna model uh, the, the updates that are being done on obfuscated programs. Okay, so, what, the, what, 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 what is the correctness and efficiency properties that, that we want here? The correctness property um, that we want is that uh, the obfuscation P1 prime uh, that's obtained by you applying the update on your obfuscated program implements the same function as P1, which is the, the updated program on my end, okay? So in particular, if, uh, uh, you have P and P prime is the obfuscated version of P, then after applying the update S on, on, on P, if you get P1, 
uh, and, and, and if you compute the update as I described on the last slide, you got the set S prime. You could up apply the update S prime to P prime to get P1 prime. Then this P1 prime implements the, the, the desired function P1. Okay? Okay. And we want this to work for, you know, arbitrary polynomially many updates. I apply an update, I found a bug, uh, so, uh, software is often, and, and doesn't have one, uh, doesn't need one update, it needs a lot more updates. So I apply an update and I send the update to you, now you're done, I have a next update, I want to keep doing this uh, an arbitrary polynomially many times, okay? And I want that for every single update that I do, um, the, the, the computational cost on my end and your end and the communication cost uh, is proportional only to poly S uh, and the security parameter, uh, ignoring poly log factors. And, and it's in, independent of the number of updates I provide. So if I'm providing the 10th update, it will again depend only on the number of changes that I'm making in that uh, step. So if I'm making the first update, it changes n bits, then I will send an update that's proportional to, to some polynomial in n. Making the second uh, update, which makes far fewer changes, then th 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 I only need to communicate uh, a correspondingly fewer number of bits. Okay? Okay. So what about security? So now with that modeling in mind and the sort of definition uh, and, and the efficiency properties, I want to define what security are we seeking. So there are several notions of security, in particular two um, the, that I'm going to talk about now. Uh, let me start with the basic one, okay? So the basic IIO security, which is, stands for incremental indistinguishable obfuscation, um, security is that if you have two equivalent programs, P and Q, and you have a sequence of updates S1 to ST. So these are unobfuscated programs, and I'm going, I, I could apply the update S1 to uh, P and get P1, and then S2 get P2 and so on, or I could apply these updates to Q uh, to get Q1 and, and so on. I'm in this case assuming that the same update is apply, being applied in the two cases, okay? So that, that's a starting point, we'll get rid of that later. So I'm going to apply the same update in the two cases, and I require that after every update, the two programs remain functionally equivalent, okay? So the, the functional equivalence property uh, remains for, uh, 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 holds uh, uh, forever in all, when these updates are applied. Then uh, I require that if I was to take obfuscations of these programs, then they together remain computationally indistinguishable. Note here that this P1 prime is not a fresh obfuscation of P1. It's also obtained by updating P prime. So this P, P, P1 prime will differ from P prime in a few number, only a few bit locations, so on P2 prime will differ from P1 prime in a few bit locations, and so on, which will all be proportional or polynomial to the changes that are being made going from P to P1 and, and so on, specifically the size of the sets S1 to ST. So this is the basic notion of security, and as I said, here we were restricting ourselves to applying the same uh, update uh, to, in, in, to the both programs. So this is sort of, might seem artificial, because if you have a program, um, it, 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 you know, if you do implementations, you're probably going to apply different patches. You're not going to change the same bit location in the same way. And not just in terms of having a restricted functionality, uh, it also has a security consequences because if you are uh, uh, you, you're applying a patch, this definition will leak the locations that are being updated, or also in particular, the, the, in what way they are being updated. And that might, uh, uh, you know, if you're applying a security patch, that might already leak the vulnerability that's there in the software that you're trying to protect, um, which could be bad as well, for against other uh, uh, pieces of code out there which have not been uh, patched so far, okay? so. To, to account for that, we define a, a stronger notion of security. I won't define it formally, but sort of is a very natural extension of what I defined on the previous slide, is that we would like to define a notion where you can apply a different set of updates. You still need functional equal, equivalence. So if I apply uh, an update to P, P1 or, or and to Q1, those updates themselves could be different, but the resulting programs need to be functional equivalent. Furthermore, if the updates that I apply are of roughly the same size, then we, can, we want to argue that the uh, computational indistinguishability, as was on this slide, still holds. Okay. So that's the, the stronger, what we call increment private IIO, or increment private, increment, uh, 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 increment private IIO security notion. Okay. 
Okay, so uh, the reason why indistinguishable reobfuscation has been that useful is because this, as I mentioned before, is sort of the best possible notion of obfuscation you could uh, hope for, okay? Um, and, and we wanted to understand what is the best achievable security in the case of uh, uh, increme you know, incremental indistinguishable obfuscation. So uh, are we really achieving that or there is a gap? Towards that, that goal, we define in the paper, again, I won't do this formally in the, the talk, but we define this incremental best possible obfuscation. It's sort of analogous to the best possible obfuscation definition. And we're able to prove that the increment is sort of a an re result analogous to the relationship between IO and best possible obfuscation, that the increment private IIO that I just defined on the previous slide is actually equivalent with uh, the increment uh, uh, best possible obfuscation. So it sort of provides some evidence that you know, maybe this is the right definition to work with. Um, and so we, we, uh, we, we use this definition and we sort of think that it's a good one. Okay, okay. so now that you know, we have this, uh, we have our definitions and uh, uh, the model in mind, let me tell you our results. The first result is sort of on the negative side. Note that I didn't talk about VBV security in the context of incrementality. And the result for there is again negative, and in fact, uh, even for, for sort of as simple as point functions. Here the problem is that if you even have a point function obfuscation, and uh, if you're trying to obfuscate a point function and then later trying to update, you know, let's say I was trying to obfuscate an n bit point function, and I want to update 10 bits of it or 100 bits of it of all the entire point function. Then in this case, achieving VBB security is hard because the size of the update already leaks the number of locations that I'm updating the point function of. So there's this sort of inherent tension and even this sort of weaker notion, uh, sort of, so even for this special functionality of point function, we're not able to achieve any kind of meaningful incrementality um, and the issues are sort of similar to the prior works on, on incremental deterministic public encryption. More specifically, we're able to prove that VBB or VGB obfuscation of point functions must have an incrementality um, which is almost as close as to the size of the function, okay? So this was a sort of a deviation. Let me come down, come back to the positive results about the, uh, the two notions of uh, uh, incremental obfuscation that I defined. The first result that we have is the sort of the, for the basic notion of IIO. That we have, you just give me IIO and a bunch of other things like one-way functions. Um, you, we can construct basic IIO for all programs and you can have them as circuits, tuning machines, or RAM programs. Uh, we can also upgrade the security. Once you have the basic IIO, you can upgrade security to incremental private uh, IIO, additionally using oblivious RAM techniques of uh, Goldreich and Ostrowski. Again, this work, this result also works for circuits, tuning machines, and RAM programs. Um, and sort of this is the, the, the positive results that we have, okay? Okay, so finally, you know, I, I don't want to go into details of it because it gets messy, but just to give you some idea of how, um, what kind of techniques that we use, especially because I think that they might be useful in other contexts, uh, in particular, they could help simplify something else that you might be trying to prove. So the techniques might be useful. And um, so sort of before getting into the, 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 the details, uh, I want to note that obfuscation inherently is a very non, you know, incrementally updatable primitive. So if I want to make it updatable, what I'm going to do is I'm going to separate the obfuscation uh, part of it with a sort of a universal circuit obfuscation thing, and the program that I want to obfuscate separately. So I can update the program uh, uh, incrementally, and, 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 and sort of the two at execution time can be fit together to work. So let's see how that works. What I'm going to do this is I'm going to do this via a general purpose obfuscation and a standard public key encryption, and I'm going to use a, a incremental signature scheme, which is going to be an incremental hash, think of the Merkle hash with special properties, and a NISIC proof system. With some properties, it's, it's, it's special. Uh, I won't go into sort of detail, but just there, there are some, it'll going to serve as sort of a signature here. Okay, so the construction idea is, it sort of uses the, the two key trick. I'm going to think of the program as a sequence of n bits, p1 to pn. I'm going to encrypt each bit twice, okay? So 
uh, using two separate public keys, PK and PK prime. So E is going to be the collection of the encryption of the bit of PI under PK, and E prime is going to be the encryption of the bits of uh, PI again under public key PK prime. Then I'm going to just hash the two together, and I'm going to sign the root of the hash. Okay? So this might seem similar to other construction that you might have previously seen, but the key aspect here is that this NISIC needs to be independent of the sizes of these ciphertexts. It needs to be small. In particular, it will depend only on the hash of the, the, the Merkle tree rather than the entire tree. Okay? So that's sort of the uh, key difference from similar things that you might have seen before. And the obfuscation itself is just going to look at everything that I generated so far, the ciphertext, the hash, the tree, the signature on the root of the hash, and an obfuscation of this program G, uh, G which has uh, P, the public uh, uh, parameters for the, the NISIC, and the secret key for the first public key encryption scheme hardwired, okay? And what this uh, program does, it takes everything as input, checks if everything was done correctly, so it checks whether the X is the input you're trying to evaluate it on. It checks whether the Merkle hashes, it, you know, it hashes, generates a Merkle hash here, checks if S is the valid signature on it uh, with parameters PP, and then if it is, it decrypts E uh, uh, using secret key SK that's hardwired, gets P, runs P of X, and, 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 and there we go. Note here, the key difference, as I pointed earlier, is that the obfuscated program has sort of nothing to do with the actual program that we're trying to obfuscate, which is a part of these ciphertexts. And these ciphertexts can be incrementally updated, okay? And, and, and that's where the update algorithm comes into play. I have these ciphertexts, the hash and the tree. To update this, uh, I, to update this the ciphertext, I only need to update the, the right locations, then change the root to leaf paths for those locations, and sign the root again. Okay, so that's all the update looks like. Um, since I'm running uh, close, uh, short of time, I'm not going to go into details of sort of the proof idea, but you can look at the paper. One thing I do want to mention is that the, the hash function, you can't use a generic hash function. We have to use an IO friendly hash function, specifically the somewhere statistically binding hash. Okay, so just some proof ideas, which you can look at the paper uh, for that. Finally, I want to say that you know, there is possibility of, of, of future work here. Um, w one aspect is that we only get a sec selectively secure notion of security. So in particular, the update sequence needs to be known before uh, for the indistinguishability hole. It would be interesting to prove the, the stronger adapter security notion. Um, a, a, you know, we can consider a, you know, specific kinds of updates. You could think of more uh, general updates, which instead of looking at subtits, look at uh, more general updates which might increase the size of the program and, and, and things like that. Uh, finally, I want to also mention a related work on um, a, a patchable obfuscation by Anant et al., uh, which also looks at this, this issue of updating software uh, or updating obfuscated software, but the two directions are sort of fundamentally different because um, they try to reduce, uh, they consider a larger class of updates but the, the running time in their case for the update still grows with the, um, the, the, the size of the program. So they don't reduce the computational cost on the, the side of the, the recipient who's trying to update the, uh, the obfuscated program. Okay? So, but you can refer to our or their paper for details on comparisons and so on. Okay, thanks.